Hello and welcome to this video on magnetic fields, all the things that seem to make everything fail in futuristic apocalyptic movies. A magnetic field is, at its simplest, a field, or vector field more precisely, that describes how a magnet interacts with everything around it, and particularly the influence that the magnetic force has. This is observable in the way electrical charges and currents shift in response to that magnet. Generally speaking, all magnets are made from magnetic material, although what that magnetic material is can vary substantially. Generally speaking, and again very broadly, a magnetic field will describe the charge as it relates to the force and how the force is moving, specifically its velocity, and the strength of the magnetic field. As a result, you'll note throughout this video that a lot of this will vary based on whether we're talking about a stationary object or a moving object, as these two can have very different effects. Nearly all material that we use for magnets today is either going to be a ferromagnetic material, such as iron, or a non-uniform magnetic product. These are generally things that are not going to be covered in this video, but as a catch-all, let's say, they do exist. Just be aware that the uh, relationship between these and magnetism is more difficult to describe for us. Generally speaking, the three forces that come under that category are paramagnetism, diamagnetism, and antiferromagnetism. In order to get these to have any real effect, you're going to have to have laboratory equipment that measures them at a tiny fractional scale. And that's why, although they exist, we won't go into depth in this video. A magnetic field will always surround anything that is magnetized. And there are permanent magnets. These are things that will always exert a magnetic force, much like a compass does. But there are also electric magnets or electromagnets. These generate their magnetic field by applying electricity to them. When you have these two different kinds on top of the previously mentioned stationary and moving magnets, you begin to see that there can be a lot of differences that are going to be happening. Fortunately, electromagnets and ferromagnets, or your more permanent magnets, don't really differ that much in the way they work, just that they can vary in what they do. When you are describing this, you draw it out as a vector field. For most instances, this is either going to be a four-way graph with your x and y axes, or a three-way graph with your x, y, and z axes. For most examples, we're really only going to talk about the x and y axes, and this is because you'll be depicting two different things. One is the electrical charge, and this is going to be your speed and direction. The electrical charge is basically how fast the magnetic force is moving and how strong that magnetic force is. The reason we use electrical fields to measure this is because, to a certain extent, magnetism and electricity used for it do correlate. This is why using magnetic field to levitate one kilogram or resisting the gravity of Earth was how the new kilogram was defined you could define it as a electrical charge required rather than as a mass. And the same thing can be done, but just not taking that extra step of measuring it against a kilogram, but instead just measuring the electrical charge required. When the field or the vector field is being drawn up, it is defined by what's called the Lorentz force law. And as it is for this video, we won't go into depth, but what it does in short is describe the motion and the charge. And this is why you have a vector field. When you draw it out, you have two different but related fields that are used. The B field and the H field. The B field basically defines a magnetic force. And this is helpful, primarily because it tells you the direction of motion. Generally speaking, they're always going to be moving in a circle as well. So this again makes things a little bit easier. The field does nearly always turn right though, and again, so if we're talking about a circle, it's basically following the face of a clock. The field also has other names such as magnetic flux density, magnetic induction, magnetic field, and a few others. The H field is also known as the magnetic field intensity or strength. Generally speaking, this is going to be pretty much exactly the same as the B field, that is, how much magnetic force exists. You will have seen repeatedly so far that what we've been showing is basically a series of lines surrounding a magnet. Those lines are your magnetic field lines, 
if you follow one from the very start of its circle to the very end of its circle, it will have exactly the same strength. This is true of every successive line where the measure at that line is exactly the same the entire way around. Not only does it tell you how strong the magnetic force is, but the direction. So this is kind of helpful, as it's almost like drawing a map where you have gradients, where each successive line on the map tells you the elevation or de-elevation of that particular part of the map. The more lines there are, and particularly the more lines there are in closer proximity, the stronger the force is and the more detail you have on the strength of that force. If you have very few lines, then you know that it's a relatively stable force with a very limited range of power behind it. Conversely, more lines, more power. But you know by looking at the numbers what that is. This is particularly useful when we talk about permanent magnets, and that is for one simple reason. They make their own magnetic fields permanently, hence the name. This is also called a persistent magnetic field. This is nearly always made out of something that's made from iron, so ferromagnetic materials. The other option to use is nickel, although more commonly iron is used. When you do it this way though, they have both a north and south pole. So again, using the example of a compass, you can know that the positive side will always point towards north and the negative side will always point south. That is on the macro scale, the very large scale. The problem is, once you start looking at it in much smaller detail, rather than just does it point up and down, you now need to look at the magnetic field around it. That magnetic field is how it gets complicated. There's actually a lot of interaction between the positive and negative end of a magnet, and this means that when you want to try and break it down and figure out just how the magnetic force is distributed around it, you actually need to look at it as a series of much smaller magnets, where you have negative and positive forces pushing against each other. The small individual forces are calculated and modelled, and when you do this, you basically get the proportional magnetic strength compared to the overall size of the magnet, and then you can figure out how the force is being exerted over that big area and why you see what is basically a peanut shape for the positive and negative sides of the magnets, or the dipoles. These are pretty much the way they are purely because you have one resisting the other to some extent or counteracting it. The actual force between magnets is just as if not more complicated. Rather than looking at just one interacting against itself, you now need to look at how two work together. And now you have, rather than two magnetic fields, you have four. This is when you need to look at how distance plays a role in the forces being exerted from each magnet to the other magnet. But when you do this, the positive and negative sides of the magnet will be pushing and pulling on each of the other sides of the magnet. So you'll have both negative and positive forces pushing on the positive side of the other magnet, and negative and positive forces pushing on the positive side of the other magnet. This also assumes that both the positive and negative sides of a magnet are of the same strength, and this is not always the case. That can be particularly important if you are trying to shift something from one direction to another. If you have a relatively weak negative side of a magnet and have another magnet applying force, the net effect is going to be substantially more in favour of positive than negative. Unfortunately, reality is not always so convenient as to give us the necessary things to have that net change so easily forced, or to produce a product that has such a convenient attribute to it. This is where we can look at things like putting a charge into something metal, particularly something iron, although as mentioned nickel will work. By introducing electricity, you can generate a magnet, and this is useful again. But not only can you generate electricity by using a magnet, but conversely, you can get power out of a magnet. And this is used in large turbine type systems, where you spin a magnet around a coil and that generates electricity. If you follow the flow of the magnetic current around something that's generating its magnetic field, you'll note that the electrons should follow along behind, and this makes a lot of sense. Electrons are negatively charged, and if they're following a magnetic field, which should be positively charged in places, you get movement of those electrons. 
when you look at them in conjunction with the map overall, you can see how certain things can be moved in certain ways. Importantly, you'll note that you can see how the further away from the parts of the magnet that are useful you get, the less power there is. When we're looking at something trying to generate electrical current using magnets, this isn't necessarily a problem, as normally these are stationary systems. You have, for lack of a better way of describing it, wire created in the form of a loop. This loop has electrons going constantly around in a circle, or something to that effect. Inside of that, you have your magnetic field. That magnetic field gets increasingly strong inside of the loop, and less strong outside of the loop. And this is what leads to the generation of the magnetic field that's very powerful, and following from that electricity. If you keep a sustained electrical current, and have a fixed length of wire, you can create a uniform permanent magnet this way. And you can reverse that polarity by reversing the direction of the current. So far we've focused on relatively small scale magnetic forces. Basically anything you can generate with a magnet to hand, or something not much larger than yourself. It's worth being aware that Earth has a magnetic field, and that it generates its own magnetic field to be exact. This is why, throughout history, and very large-scale history, the magnetic field of Earth has flipped repeatedly. This has made the South Pole the North Pole, and the North Pole the South Pole. Generating this magnetic field is a consequence of Earth having a molten iron core, or more accurately, the area around the core, the outer core. When you spin this molten iron mass, you get something very similar to what occurs with a turbine. That is, the mass of moving molten metal is hot. That heat, plus the metal, generates an electric force, which in conjunction with the iron, leads to the creation of magnetism. As it spins around Earth, you get the development of a moving magnetic field that basically rolls around the Earth. This magnetic effect creates what can be best described as a current, and that current means that more iron is pushed in the same direction, which is a positive feedback loop. This leads to the final interesting thing about magnetic forces, and particularly as they relate to Earth. When you think of a compass, you think it points to true north, but that's not the case. North, as it is in the magnetic sense, is actually 11 degrees off from true north. This means that when your compass is pointing north, it's not actually north, but magnetic north. This is important to note, as if you're trying to line things up, it's useful to have that particular knowledge that you need to adjust by 11 degrees. Further to that trivia, the actual pole's location does shift somewhat, and this is a result of that movement of all the molten iron and the other processes involved in generating that magnetic force. It means that there is a shift in just where the center or the peak of the magnetic force is that your compass arrow will be drawn to. Hopefully now you understand that magnets and magnetic force do much more than just point magnetic north. They have a role in not only taking electricity and using it, but generating electricity. That the actual plotting of them is really quite bizarre and unusual, because it's not just a fixed understanding. It has to allow for the fact that there is a lot of difference in what's going on based on the kind of magnetic force you're looking at. And understand that this is a gross oversimplification of everything that goes into magnetism. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.